Okay, I guess we'll make a start. It's it's quarter past. Um, so thanks to everyone who's managed to join this Teams call, um, and you'll have realised that we've had some issues with the BHS um, Zoom account again. Um, so hopefully you've made it over to Teams. Uh, I'm. We've got firstly got a talk by Professor Howard Wheater. Um, which will happen very soon. And then um, we'll have a short break before we go into the, the BHS AGM as well at um, 11.30. Um, but I wanted to say how delighted I am um, to have um, Howard Wheater talking today. Um, the first time I was on the BHS committee, I think Howard was actually president. And obviously he has a long history with the BHS. He president from, I think, um, 1999 to 2001. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Howard. I think um, that's right. Yeah, and so Howard's now at the University of Sask Saskatchewan in Canada, um, and he's been there since October 2010, when he took up a role as Canada Excellence Research Chair in Water Security. Um, and he he's the director of the Global Institute for Water Security as well there. Um, when I that's, that's just a, a minor correction. So I've oh, retired sorry. from those retired from those positions now, Haley. Oh, have you? Oh, I'm, okay. just, I'm just an emeritus person. Oh, okay. Oh, well, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, so when I first knew Howard, he was at Imperial College um, London, and he was obviously there before he moved moved over to Canada. Um, so I'm absolutely delighted to invite Howard Wheater to talk today um, before we have our BHS um, AGM. So please, please do start, Howard. Okay, well, it's really a great pleasure to be back talking to the BHS family and see old friends. Um, I offered this talk because uh, I think, you know, we're all aware that water resources globally are under increasing pressure. And one of the ways those pressures are resolved is through the legal system so that then raises some quite interesting challenges for um, how uh, a legal system copes with what can be quite complex and, and often conflicting scientific inf information. So I had the distinct privilege of um, appearing before the International Court of Justice in the three cases that they've heard contend with international water disputes. So. I thought it'd be interesting just to talk through those experiences and um, the, the challenges that the court has had um, and also more generally some of the, the difficulties in assessing scientific evidence in, in a legal context. I'm going to finish off with a discussion about the use and misuse of hydrological models, um, which um, will be of interest to, I think, to those of you involved in modelling. So um, Gemma is very kindly going to manage my slides. Uh, Gemma, next slide. Uh, just click through the options. OK, so um, there are a huge number of transboundary rivers, um, and it's perhaps surprising that there haven't been more disputes um, that, that, than have arisen. Um, there are increasing tensions in, in, in many parts of the world over the water. I mean, the US and Canada has had a very amicable relationship, for example, but uh, certainly under the previous president of the US, things were getting a little bit more confrontational. And um, if we look to the Middle East, there are many examples of uh, potential flashpoints over shared rivers. Uh, another issue in general about transboundary water is that um, there's a legacy of agreements which are often made a long time ago in really a different era where there was a different ethos, um, very much a focus on growth and economic development, um, and less importance attached to issues like water quality in ecosystems. Um, so if we mix that with the current pressures of climate change and population growth, um, then uh, it's, it's evident that I think we are facing current challenges and these are only going to get more pronounced in the future. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to take you on a trip to the Netherlands. So The Hague is the home of two international courts. There's the International Criminal Court, which you um, may be aware of, which um, uh, handles war crimes. But then the UN has a, a, its world court, 
which is called the International Court of Justice in this rather splendid building, the Peace Palace in The Hague. Next slide. Um, the court, next uh, click. Um, okay, so this is, um, this is Argentina versus Uruguay. Um, what you'll see is that we have a bench of, um, uh, there are 15 judges, permanent members of the court. And then if a, co if, if a country is not uh, represented on the bench, then it can have um, an ad hoc representation. So you can get um, up to 17 judges and they come up to a consensus opinion. Next slide. So um, over its history, the International Court of Justice has handled three water disputes. Um, and um, some of these involve some of the world's largest rivers and some, some of the world's smallest. And I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk you through these. Um, I declare an interest. So I appeared as counsel and advocate for Hungary. I appeared as counsel and advocate for Argentina. And then I was an expert for uh, Chile in the Chile Bolivia case. So there's a kind of tint on my presentation that I apologize for um, due to those um, allegiances. So I'm going to start off with the Danube. Um, next slide. Um, so the Danube is, of course, an iconic river. Um, it flows through nine countries. Um, it's um, the, the section I'm going to talk about runs from um, at the top, there's Bratislava, which is the capital of Slovakia. And at the bottom, you'll see Budapest, capital of Hungary. And there's a roughly 250 kilometer section there that um, was the subject of um, a dispute that arose uh, in the 80s and the 90s uh, around the Gabčíkovo Narodžamaros project. So um, I'm going to talk really about two areas of interest. As the river flows down from Bratislava, there's a radical decrease in river slope. And over geological time, that's led to the deposition of a huge alluvial system. Um, and in Hungary, that's called the Zagetkus, and you can see that indicated on the map. So it's a really special area. It's obviously um, a major wetland. It's crisscrossed with channels that interconnect with the uh, main branches of, of the river. Um, and it overlies um, a very large freshwater aquifer, about 750 kilometers in extent. Now, interestingly, that aquifer is recharged not not um, from, from rainfall, but mainly from the river. Um, and of course, the river flows peak in summer. So we have peak groundwater recharge of shallow groundwater systems in summer that rises the water table and that provides a natural wetting, sub-irrigation of the soil profiles. And that's very important, not just for the, uh, the wetland habitats, but also there's a lot of agriculture that really depends on this natural moisture regime. So that's one area of interest. The second area, if you look just above Budapest, there's a Santenda Island. And in that section, uh, just above Budapest, um, Budapest gets 60% of its drinking water from bank filtered wells. So these are wells um, drilled in the river bank, um, but the water is pumped uh, effectively from the river through the river gravels, and that provides a natural cleaning effect. So it's high quality um, uh, drinking water with relatively few on costs in terms of further treatment required. Next slide. So a little bit of um, geopolitics now. So if we go back to the 1950s, this was an era of major hydraulic projects and thinking big about, uh, about these schemes. And a plan was mooted to um, bypass the River Danube um, in, in a section from um, just south of Bratislava um, through a canal and a power, a power uh, station at Gapchikovo, returning the flow to the river at uh, a town called Sap. And the plan was to um, build a reservoir at Dunakility and that would hold back the Danube flows so they could generate peak power twice a day. So this would give rise to a four and a half meter wave moving down the Danube, uh, which obviously would be very damaging. So to mitigate that, um, it was planned to build a second dam at Najimaros downstream 
And because the river is so flat, that has a very long backwater and that would damp out the fluctuations. So there will be um, 720 megawatts of capacity at Gabjakovo, and then Najimarosh would generate another 158 megawatts. And the power will be shared between the two states. And at that stage, we're talking about Czechoslovakia and Hungary. So this was a project that um, was signed as a treaty in 1977 under quite a lot of pressure from the Soviet bloc. There was a, a, a group called Comicon, the economic community of the Soviet Union countries and associates. Um, and they wanted to see this project go ahead for economic development and also to take some pressure off um, oil and gas supplies from the Soviet Union. It took a long time to get the money together, but um, in the 80s, um, construction started. Um, and then we get towards the end of the 80s and of course a huge geopolitical transformation in um, Eastern Europe. And that had major effects for the project. Um, in the run up to this period, there were people that were strongly opposed to the project. The original project, um, bearing in mind that the Danube has an average flow of about 2000 cumex, the original project was to divert most of that down the power canal and just allow 50 cumex um, down the old channel. So people were extremely upset on environmental grounds, but um, uh, protest was effectively suppressed and um, there were government scientists who objected and they simply lost their careers. But come to the end of the 80s and there was a sense of um, imminent um, freedoms and democracy was in fact just around the corner. Uh, and there were mass demonstrations in the streets of Budapest, up to 40,000 people opposed to the impacts of this project. So in response to this, but after a lot of um, rather difficult deliberation, Hungary decided to suspend its involvement with the project. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, at that point, Czechoslovakia um, decided it was going to proceed anyway. So it built a new dam at Chernovo, where it controls both banks of the river. It completed the um, power canal and, and the power station. And uh, in 1992, October, then there was a unilateral diversion of the Danube. Um, and then just a couple of months later, January the 1st, Czechoslovakia ceased to be a state and Slovakia came into existence. So there was um, obviously a, a huge conflict over this. And um, despite European med mediation, uh, there was no agreement on how to proceed. And so the case came to court, the International Court of Justice. Next slide. So um, Hungary's concerns were, were many, um, but particularly the impacts on the flora and fauna of the Segecus and fish were an important part of that. Uh, there was the loss of the recharge to the alluvial aquifer and the dynamics uh, of that recharge, which helped maintain high quality groundwater systems. There were concerns for the effect of the upper reservoir eutrophication, sediment deposition, which could lead to um, reducing conditions which would give poor groundwater quality. And then there were concerns about impacts of the downstream dam uh, on the uh, bank filled water supply. So you could get scour of the gravels um, and also upstream of the dam sediment deposition and the degrading uh, fine sediments could um, write off the uh, high water quality of those, of those wells. Next slide. So the argument from Slovakia um, was really that this could all be managed. So uh, if there were going to be adverse effects in the wetlands, those could be overcome by constructing networks of small weirs. Um, any problems in the upper reservoir could be managed um, by channeling the flows to prevent fine sediment deposition. Um, and the problems with the Budapest bank fil filtered wells, um, they said had been created by Hungary's over extraction of river gravels, which in fact had been quite a major issue. Next slide. 
So um, this is uh, a, a diagram from Hungary's memorial. This is the first piece of written evidence given to the court in 1994. And you can see there the time series of flows on the left, um, showing the uh, huge reduction in flows down the old channel. Um, and uh, the next slide shows some pictures of the impacts on the system. So you have this beautiful, pristine um, uh, aquatic wetland system before the uh, diversion, and then you have the reality afterwards. And um, uh, there were massive fish, fish kills, in fact, um, following the, um, the diversion of the major flows. Next slide. Uh, and uh, this is a diagram that shows the reduction in groundwater levels. And if you look at the insets, you can see the time series of groundwater. Um, and you can see that um, the big seasonal fluctuations are damped and there's a significant reduction in groundwater levels. Next slide. So um, it came after um, various exchanges of written evidence to the oral hearings. And Hungary's case was, well, it didn't like the reservoir. It was a barrier to fish migration, a complete barrier. There were very little, um, this is about a year after operation. And there was very little data coming from Slovakia, um, but the, it seemed that there'd been some, uh, a doubling of chlorophyll A uh, due to the reservoir. So the <coughs> concerns for eutrophication were there. Um, there had been major degradation in the Segecus wetland system. Um, and a big point of, of debate had been the role of temporary weir, a role of weirs in managing the system. So Hungary um, didn't want to install weirs. It believed that the system should be pristine, but it installed one weir. And then it found that there was quite substantial deposition of fine silts. Um, that there was uh, loss of spawning grounds, uh, loss of the groundwater dynamics, uh, loss of navigation, um, and then uh, there was degradation of groundwater quality. And then where the main canal rejoined the river, then there was fairly significant scour in quite a short period. Next slide. Um, now, next slide, next click, thanks. Okay, so, um, Slovakia's arguments had really been all along that this could be managed. Um, but uh, just before the oral hearings came to court, um, uh, Slovakia presented a very large report, which had been carried out by um, European and Slovakian funding um, by the Danish Hydraulics Institute uh, in conjunction with Dutch colleagues and also Slovakian colleagues. And they put together quite a big modeling program, an impressive modeling program for the time, um, uh, combining Mike Shi, Mike 11, uh, and a water quality module, Mike 21, and then um, a crop model, Daisy. And uh, Jens Christian Refsgaard was the lead um, expert for DHI. Some of you will know him well. Um, and um, he made some very strong statements based on the DHI modeling. He uh, said, well, our modeling of the reservoir shows that the flows can be managed to prevent sediment deposition. So all those concerns um, about threats to infiltration, eutrophication uh, go away. Uh, and um, the weirs and the Sagetkas can maintain water levels. They could be operated to reproduce the groundwater dynamics and their simulations indicated no concerns for groundwater quality. So that was quite a powerful um, testimony by Jens Christian. Um, next click, please. So um, Hungary uh, brought in some independent experts, um, particularly people that had uh, been involved in writing uh, in, the, in the sediment research that had been used by DHI. And they were very critical of the sediment modeling because they thought they'd got the sediment dynamics all wrong. And then um, there was also a water quality expert who came in and said that really the water quality modeling was flawed and quite uncertain. So Hungary's arguments as expressed by me at the time were that, well, we've got some very interesting modeling, but it's not at all reliable enough to make um, credible predictions of long-term effects as the basis for policy. So we have this 
major conflict in the evidence. Next slide. So we then come to the court's response to this. Well, the court had to decide on various points of law. Um, and the first major point was whether Hungary had been entitled to withdraw from the 1977 treaty. And they said, um, no, Hungary was not. Hungary had acted illegally. They required to demonstrate imminent peril um, to uh, justify that. And uh, the judge's view was that this um, implementation of the scheme was not something uh, that caused imminent peril. It uh, was something that might have caused long-term problems, but there was a potential management. So it wasn't an argument that su was sustained. On the other hand, um, they concluded that Czechoslovakia um, was not entitled to unilaterally divert the Danube. So um, Slovakia uh, had acted illegally. So Hungary owed Slovakia damages, but Slovakia owned, owned Hungary damages. And wouldn't it be nice if they cancelled out? Um, and then their recommendation was um, that the two sides should do um, a better uh, risk assessment and come up to um, agree a joint operational regime. And that was the judgment on the law. Next slide. Um, they made an interesting comment about the science. Uh, they said, well, there's some interesting and impressive scientific material. Uh, the court's given it very careful consideration, um, but has not felt it necessary to, to judge between the opposing views. Um, so it kind of ducked any um, critique of science. Although um, I think it's, in, in my opinion, the, the decision that uh, Hungary had acted illegally in withdrawing from the treaty essentially was accepting um, an, a scientific argument from Slovakia that um, there were no um, uh, essential immediate uh, perils resulting from that. Okay, next slide. So um, that's the first big case. It was a big geopolitical uh, issue, all um, wrapped up around uh, the breakdown of the old Soviet Union, one of Europe's biggest rivers, um, and uh, both sides accepted the agreement and have since then moved to work on joint operation and also to try and manage the, um, the, the water level in the wetlands. Uh, I'm going to turn now um, to, to the next case, which um, takes us from Europe to South America and to one of South America's major rivers. This is the River Uruguay. Uruguay River Uruguay flows from Bolivia uh, and then forms a, a border between Argentina and Uruguay, and it discharges into the Plate Estuary. And uh, just uh, towards the upper end of the, of the tidally affected reaches, uh, Argentina planned to build, uh, sorry, Uruguay planned to build two large pulp mills. So there'd been major expansion of plantation forestry. Um, wood processing was important economic um, contributor to the Uruguayan economy, and they wanted to build these two pulp mills. Um, uh, and they're shown on the left inset, um, and I'm going to focus on the left hand one of these called the Orion Mill. And just opposite um, is um, Argentina, and in particular, a big tourist area. So it's a very scenic area. Um, and um, this proposal created a lot of uh, adverse opinion in Argentina. So there were concerns about air pollution, there were concerns about water pollution, there was concerns about visual impact. And there was a couple of bridges linking Argentina and Uruguay, and those were closed for prolonged periods by public demonstrations blocking the roads. So a lot of, a lot of um, dissent within Argentina. Uh, and so the case came to the International Court for resolution. Next slide. So um, the concerns that Argentina had were that there's really a lot of phosphorus and nitrate going to be pumped into the river from this power plant. And the river Uruguay is already full of nutrients. Um, so it's already up to an order of magnitude uh, greater phosphorus concentration 
than local standards. Um, during the proceedings, um, actually, um, Uruguay had carried on building the first plant. It scrapped the second plant, but it carried on building the first plant, and that came into operation. And um, during that time, there was a, a very large algal bloom that occurred just opposite the plant. And um, because it's uh, influenced by tidal flows, this moved upstream by 25 kilometers and then came downstream again. And this scum was full of eucalyptus products. Uh, and it had um, toxic blue-green algae at pretty high concentrations. So it seemed obvious to Argentina that this was a result of the mill effluent. Uh, and Argentina did a lot of work on the flora and fauna, uh, and it showed um, accumulation of uh, uh, various toxic substances in river sediments, um, non-infilols, uh, non-infilols appearing in aquatic life, uh, dioxins and furans in fish, and so on. So um, Europe, Argentina felt it had fairly strong evidence about the adverse impacts of this. Um, and of course, one of its arguments was that if you were in Europe um, with a river that had this level of nutrient concentrations, you would not be allowed to, uh, to uh, discharge further effluents into this already threatened system. On the other hand, Uruguay argued that the pulp mills were in its essential economic interest. Um, it produced experts from Canada to say everything was operating to the best available technology standards. And they argued that the water quality emissions fell within the agreed water quality uh, regulatory limits. And um, they didn't do um, a, a great job on the monitoring, but they argued that uh, if you compared the upstream and the downstream water quality, there weren't any significantly, statistically significant differences. Next slide. So the court came to its decision and um, the court was split on this. It voted 11 votes to three. Uh, and it concluded that there was no conclusive evidence to show that Uruguay had not acted with due diligence or that the effluent discharges from the Orion mill had deteriorous effects or caused harm to living resources or the quality of the water or the ecological balance of the river. Um, so uh, on the other hand, there were the dissenters and the next slide um, gives their uh, dissenting opinion by Bruno Simmer and uh, another judge, uh, Judge Al Kisawana. Um, and they were very critical of the way in which um, the, the judges had considered this evidence. Uh, and their conclusion was that the court on its own is not really able adequately to assess and weigh complex scientific evidence of the type presented by the parties. <clears throat> so the judgment um, went uh, for very much for Uruguay, um, but at the same time, uh, the decision really raised um, some tensions in the legal process as to the way in which the court was going to handle evidence. And um, I had appeared in both of those cases as counsel and advocate, um, because really the role of a scientific expert acting for one of the parties is to give a lot of advice as to the validity of the evidence on the both sides. And you really become part of the team. Um, but the judges were discussed this and they were very unhappy about the use of experts in this way. And they said, well, from now on, really, we expect our experts to be um, uh, seen as independent more directly and to be available for cross-examination. OK, we're going to move on. Next slide. So I'm going to bring you um, right up to date. Um, so uh, we're now coming to a case which has run for the last um, six years. It came to court last year. It was heard in over a few weeks in April, and the judgment was issued in December 2022. And um, we're going from two of the world's bigger rivers to uh, one of the world's tiniest rivers, the River Salala. Next slide. 
Okay, so we're going to go to the north of Chile, and we're going to go to the edges of the Atacama Desert. So the Atacama Desert is probably the driest desert in the world. We used to fly to a city called Kalama, where the average precipitation is zero. Um, so water is, is very precious. So although this is a very small stream, average flow 170 liters per second, and you can step over it, um, then the water is extremely valuable. So this little stream um, rises in some headwater wetlands. You can see them on the map, the Cajones and Orientalis wetlands. Uh, a multitude of springs emerging um, and generating wetland vegetation. And then the river flows through a major ravine across the border from Bolivia uh, into Chile. And it's very much a groundwater dominated system. Um, you'll notice perhaps some of the elevations. So the wetlands are at 4,300 meters, but we have a couple of volcanic peaks there of 5,600, 5,700. And in the middle of the picture, a small peak, uh, the Cerrito de Salala, which we're gonna show you some photos from in a moment. So it's very high, it's very remote, it's very high elevation. There's um, a, a police station there in the Kaliri, and um, you might think that the policemen have a quiet time there, but in fact, um, there have been several um, deaths because it's a, a, a smuggling route from Bolivia to Chile um, and some nasty things go on there. <clears throat> Next slide. So here are some pictures from that hill, the Cerrito de Salala. So looking north into the wetlands and looking south down into Chile and that major ravine. And on the bottom right, you can see the mighty river Salala. It's not quite the Danube nor the river Uruguay. Um, it's, uh, it's something that you can literally step over um, 170 liters a second. Next slide. So I talked about the importance of water here, and um, there's a company which is interesting. It's called the Antofagasta Bolivia Railway Company, and in Spanish that translates to the initials SCAB, FCAB. Uh, it's a British company, and um, needless to say, they run ran the railway from Antofagasta to Bolivia. Um, they needed water for their trains and Antofagasta needed water for the city of Antofagasta, uh, many hundreds of kilometers away. So um, the Antofagasta Bolivia Railway Company obtained a license from Bolivia to take water from Bolivian territory in 1908. And then later in 1942, um, they built a second intake just downstream the border in Chile um, which you can see uh, on the map. And then um, there was a third extraction taken later on in the 50s by a mining company, Cal Codelco, which it uses for its camp and for mining activities. That pretty much uses most of the water of the Salala. Next slide. Now, one of the interesting um, aspects of the case concerns this picture. So. In 1928, uh, was a young Scottish engineer by the name of Wells, who um, was given the job of um, constructing a network of small channels in these wetlands by the company. And um, they were concerned, according to letters at the time, about sediments in the water supply and insect breathing in the wetlands. So they put in a network of channels that were quite small, 20 to 30, typically, 20 to 30 centimeters deep and wide, up to up to 50 centimeters in places, but um, a, a dense network, but quite small channels. Um, and these actually became quite a bone of contention um, in the subsequent court hearings. So just remember that. Next slide. Now we come to um, Bolivian politics. Um, so some of you will remember that Bolivia's first um, native Indian president was a, a man called Evo Morales. Um, and Evo Morales 
whipped up quite a storm about this small stream. So in 1999, Bolivia wrote a note to Chile saying, this isn't an international river, it's nothing like it. It's only flowing across the border because of these artificial works that were constructed in 1928. And uh, in the, this, this bubbled along for a long time and then um, halted up 2016, uh, he was publishing articles in the um, Bolivian media uh, with quite a strong tone. Um, so um, uh, the ward course was conducted to northern Chile by means of an artificial system of adequate, adequate aqueducts. Each day, Chile makes an illegal and cunning use of that natural resource without compensating a cent. So this was very much playing to local politics the local communities, indigenous communities in the region uh, were very upset about this uh, idea that Chile was stealing Bolivia's water. Um, so um, Chile was upset about this. Really, Chile wanted simply to have the river recognized as an international water course subject to normal international law. And so Chile brought this case to the international court. Next slide. 2017. <clears throat> um, so we did a lot of interesting science. Uh, on, 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 there was a lot of good work done on both sides. Um, Chile, in its 2017 first written pleadings, its memorial, um, showed that the Salala had actually flowed down that current ravine for around about 8,000 years. Um, and certainly there'd been flows in previous uh, fluvial systems flowing from what is now Bolivia to what is now Chile um, over the millennia before that. Um, and um, in Bolivia's response, Bolivia um, hired DHI as its consultants, and DHI uh, was strongly of the opinion that the Salala was indeed an international river. So um, in Bolivia's arguments, it, um, it conceded that point but it turned its attention very much to those little channels. And it said, well, Chile has received artificial flow due to this channelization. And um, that artificial flow isn't subject to the rules of customary international law. And Chile should be paying for this extra water, uh, even though the channels have nothing to do with Chile. <laughs> um, anyway, a, a big bone of contention was um, by how much will the flow have increased? So we've got um, very large topography, we've got these huge mountain peaks, we've got the wetland springs and we've got these little channels. How much will the channels have increased the surface flow? Um, clearly they've lowered the water table um, and marginally increased the groundwater flow gradient. Um, what effect will that have had? Next slide. So, um, DHI once again turned to Mike Shi and Mike Eleven. So Mike Shi is the hydrological model that many of you will know. Mike Eleven, the river flow routing hydraulic model, and they simulated um, the effects of this channelization as a 30 to 40 percent increase in flow. Next slide. Oh, next clip. Yeah, thank you. So. Um, uh, that seemed to us, us being Chile and me, um, a, a, a wild estimate, um, because just looking at the situation and considering the hydraulic gradients, we, we thought that at most you're talking about a couple of percent effect. And somehow with this very large complex modeling, somehow they come up with 30 to 40% increase in flow. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the modeling, which I think is, is interesting and salutary. Um, so DHI considered um, three different scenarios. So the current situation with baseline, and they used Xi and Mike 11 to model the little canals and the river flow. And then they had a scenario where they took out the canals and just used Mike Xi. And then they said, well, if you didn't have these canals, really, you'd have long term aggradation because you get peat development. So let's allow for 60 centimeters of peat to have grown over a few decades or centuries. 
and we'll have that as a wetland restoration scenario. And that um, running those simulations, they came to 30 to 40 percent increase in surface flow. And they were, however, modeling a, a rather small area, the near field, uh, just around the um, uh, just around the, the stream and the wetlands. So our first thoughts, uh, as in Chile, were, well, uh, this obviously seems to us wrong, but why is it wrong? And maybe it's something to do with the boundary conditions. Um, so we looked at this. Next slide. And um, what um, uh, DHI had done was to fix the boundary conditions. They had some fixed heads and some low flow boundary conditions. Um, and so we were able to show that that um, had an effect of increasing the impact of any changes. Um, because the change the, the boundaries were so close to the river that the changes um, would feed back to the boundary conditions. So um, in their written pleadings, DHI said, well, yes, you were right. We agree with that. There's some effective boundary conditions. So we'll do a sensitivity analysis. And then they came up with a range of 11 to 33 percent as the increase in flow due to the channelization. So we thought Again, this is crazy. It's too big. Um, why is it too big? So we said to DHI, well, you know, it'd be really helpful if we could look at your data. And they said, well, you don't need to look at our data because it's all in the reports, um, which it wasn't. And then we said again, well, we really need to look at your data. And then finally, uh, they released all the data files for the um, Mike 11 and Mike She runs. Next slide. So we, we got quite a shock. So this is work done by Magdalena Lagas, who interestingly is joining Imperial College as an MSc student in October. Um, uh, we found that they'd been injecting water into the model for the different scenarios in different amounts. So it was fairly obvious that they'd have more water in the um, low canal, in, in, in the, um, uh, situation with canals because they'd injected extra water into the model. Um, they'd also um, made some, um, well, potentially errors, but certainly they'd use very different topographies of up to 13 meters for modeling the different scenarios. Um, they'd also used very different initial conditions for different scenarios. And they'd had very large instabilities in the simulations. Um, so that introduced extra error. And also, um, there's some flow channel flows outside the main channel, so there are errors in the, the detailed hydraulic modeling. Um, so these were some fairly basic and very serious um, issues of concern that were not at all apparent from any of the um, evidence presented to the court. Next slide. So with a physically based model, all the water should come in through the boundaries. Um, but in this case, they'd ejected additional water to try and get the spring flows right. Um, and they'd ejected it in different ways for the different scenarios. So sometimes it was injected, became surface water, sometimes it became groundwater. Um, next slide. Um, so here's a map of some of the differences in elevation that they used, both negative in red and positive dark green, um, so very different um, topographies between the different scenarios. Next slide shows some of the instabilities in their running of Mike 11. So this was run as a transient model with steady state inputs, um, but this is what the output looked like. So there's huge instabilities at uh, those two downstream locations illustrated there. And there were quite significant differences between the Mike Xi flows and the Mike 11 flows, even though the models were coupled. So there seemed to be some obvious errors. So what we did, what Magdalena did, was to, um, we got a license for the DHI software and ran the models. Next slide. So um, we managed to make some simple changes to the time stepping, got rid of the instabilities. Um, and we used both models for all scenarios. We used the same topography. We still kept their 
injected water, but we had the same amount in the different scenarios. And hey presto, we got um, a 2% change in flows from Mike Shi and a 3% from Mike 11. Bearing in mind that the boundary conditions are wrong, so these are exaggerated effects. So in parallel to this, we Chile developed its own models. Next slide. So we built um, a hydrological model to simulate the recharge to the basin. Uh, and this is really uncertain. So we had quite a lot of uncertainty analysis with a range of precipitation inputs and model parameters. And we then sent a range of feasible recharges off to a groundwater model. Next slide which was developed by Adam Taylor, that some of you may know, he used to be based in Birmingham, he's now living in Madrid. And he built um, a, a, a variable mesh mod flow model, which was able to do a really good job at reproducing the buildup of flows in the wetlands and down the channel, channel system and matching the observed groundwater flows. Next slide. And um, this is a simulation going right to the left of the flows from the headwater springs down the channel. And the big drop is, of course, the abstraction by <clears throat> the Antofagasta Bolivia Railway Company. And his results showed that the removal of the channels was about a 0.9% effect. And if you allow some peak growth, it's a, a 2% effect, which is really what we thought all along. Next slide. So there's some really interesting issues because um, some evidence was presented to the court by Bolivia and by DHI, which in our opinion was grossly misleading. Now, certainly you're really pushing models to uh, model very small changes in what are very complex systems. Um, and in principle, uh, the suite of models that we're using was, was good, but the implementation had some major challenges. Next uh, point. Um, so we've seen that you've got a very impressive modeling system uh, and uh, that can be extremely convincing, particularly in a legal context, but the results were wholly misleading. Next slide, next point. Um, so it's clear, I think that um, when models are being used in an adversarial context, um, at the least you require some very detailed scrutiny uh, to provide confidence in the results. The next slide. Um, and those model results should pass tests of common sense and be checked where possible using simple analytical calculations. And if DHI had done that, um, it would have um, seen that those simulations were implausible. So complex models can be useful. They must be used with caution. They must recognize the uncertainties in the inputs and parameterizations and one way forward is, of course, to use multiple models um, so you can have more confidence in the results. Next point. Um, and I think in the legal context, there's a real challenge in um, ensuring that there's some independent review and assessment. And uh, certainly uh, when I've been involved in issues in the US involving major projects, um, uh, the ability to, to have uh, independent peer review has been an important part of the legal process. Next slide. So um, there's me in court being cross-examined by a man called Mr. Bundy, Rob Bundy. And next to me, you might see uh, Dennis Peach, who uh, was formerly chief scientist of BGS, who was working with me on um, this case intensively uh, on the geology and hydrogeology. A very nerve-wracking experience because the court insisted that we be cross-examined and we had six or seven years of evidence and um, we weren't allowed to take any notes with us. But um, uh, at any rate, it was a, a positive experience in, in the end for uh, Chile. Next slide. The, the judgment was disappointing for Chile. Um, basically, during the pleadings, um, I'd already mentioned that uh, Bolivia agreed that Salala River was an international watercourse. And during the oral pleadings, it also agreed that any extra water would also be classed as belonging to the international watercourse in its entirety. So the court said, well, it really didn't have to make a judgment 
because there was no longer any disagreement between the two parties. So that was disappointing to Chile, who'd really wanted a clear declaration um, on the status of the river. Next slide. There were, however, um, oh, and I, I should say um, that um, a lot of good science came out on both sides from this work. And we have a special issue of Wires Water um, in publication right now. And there are nine papers out so far. Next slide. Um, so I was going to say that um, just to conclude on the legal process that um, two or three of the judges were very unhappy about the fact that the court had not made a more positive um, declaration about the status of the river. So just to conclude, um, I've presented three stories uh, from the International Court, which I think shows some reluctance on the part of the judges to come up with uh, an adjudication on conflicting scientific opinions and uh, a discussion of the fact that maybe they need to have expert opinion to draw on. And so just in closing, can you click please? Um, I, I just wanted to mention the Indus Waters uh, arbitration. Um, so I was involved in an arbitration between India and Pakistan on the Indus and a court of arbitration was established at the permanent court of arbitration, which incidentally is also in the same building as the International Court of Justice. And under the Indus Waters Treaty, this court has seven members, including one highly qualified engineer, which was me. And um, we had a very productive um, uh, arbitration, I think, because um, clearly the judges are very smart, uh, but they're not hydrologists. Um, and um, being able to have a continued dialogue in the court about the technical issues, I found very helpful uh, learning from them and they found a very helpful learning from me. Um, this was a case where um, India was diverting water from one tributary of the Indus to another tributary to generate hydropower and Pakistan objected because it was generating hydropower downstream. So we judged that that diversion was legal um, but we also judged that India had to be very careful about the design of the dam um, so as to not to um, create extra storage that Pakistan uh, could be used against Pakistan in a hostile situation. Next slide. So um, the court's judgment was that India may divert water from one car from the river to the power plant. It must maintain a minimum flow in the river and we decided what that would be. Um, and India could not draw down um, the, power, the, um, the, the, the hydroelectric dam um, for flushing of sediments um, because of uh, the violation of the treaty. So next slide. Um, in the next slide. Um, so Pakistan said uh, India caught backs Pakistan and the... Uh, uh, Indian press said that India is free to go ahead. So both sides declared a win. And I think that was a sign of a successful arbitration. <laughs> Next slide. So just to conclude, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I just want to make a few points. I think water is and will increasingly be a source of tension at international levels and also at national levels. Um, National and international treaties are important, but often they're outdated and need to be um, brought up to date with cons current concerns. That's a real legal challenge, certainly playing out radically in the Western US at the moment. Next point. Um, I think that it's remarkable how little hostility there's been over international waters and often the experts from different countries work very well together uh, but there have been cases successfully resolved by the International Court of Justice. But clearly, um, from the discussion I presented, uh, there are some challenges around handling of scientific evidence, particularly where you've got two um, sets of experts giving opposite opinions. The judges are very smart people. They would find it very difficult to make informed judgments in that situation. Next slide. 
Um, there is a key role for science in dispute re resolution. And I think that um, uh, the, the example of the Indus arbitration um, shows that um, there can be a very fruitful blending of science and legal expertise to move forward with some of these disputes. And um, I'm sure that those are some of the issues that the International Court is considering at the moment. And then finally, the, po the point about modeling that um, complex models can be convincing in court, but really they have to be open to independent scrutiny. So I'd like to close there. I hope that I've presented a few case studies, which I think have some geopolitical interest and a lot of scientific interest, and hopefully I've um, uh, caused you maybe to think a little bit more carefully about um, uh, the role of the legal uh, system and uh, uh, arbitration between competing parties as we move forward to a world with probably increasing conflicts. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Howard. Um, that was fascinating. <laughs> And and really interesting to see. Um, I mean, obviously, these sort of conflicts are quite common, um, but just to see how science can be used and misused in these in informing these these um, these assessments and this sort of expert opinion. Um, and I'm, I, I was staggered to hear, hear that you're not allowed notes as well. That sounds <laughs> pretty harsh, actually. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> Um, we've got time for a few quick questions, if there are any questions from anybody online. Um, I don't know if there's any in the question and answers or the chat. Don't think there's any in, the, in those yet, Hayley. Um, but there's, there's not many on the call, so we can probably just um, shout out. Um, I've got a question. Great, yeah. why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> um, so well thank you first of all Howard for that really insightful talk. Um, I have been in that situation of being cross-examined um, without any notes allowed as well um, and I was really interested in what you said about the, the sort of the mistakes in the modelling because I've I've been in disputes about modelling in court um, and I've been the one making the mistakes as well as the one pointing out other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered what your experience was, you know, when when mistakes were identified, how did the people responsible react to that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, was it possible to sort of move on beyond that and, and reach agreement? Um, well, a couple of points, I think. Um, uh, basically, there was no real acceptance by DHI that there were mistakes. Um, so they kind of um, tried to argue that um, injection of additional water was perfectly reasonable, despite <laughs> the, the violation of the laws of continuity for their model. Um, <laughs> so they kind of stonewalled on that. Um, um, we, we, I've shown you more evidence than, that was presented to the court. So um, there was a real issue of, of timing because we actually, Chile finished its modeling after all the written pleadings. And so our legal team really didn't want us introducing new evidence at the last minute because that would have seriously delayed the proceedings. Um, so I was strong, I had my arm twisted right behind my back not to talk about um, Chile's modeling because that hadn't been presented to the court. Um, and in fact, the lawyers were quite right because the judgment was all based on the legal issues and the details of whether it was 2% or 40% were actually immaterial to the, to the case. So they made a, a shrewd judgment call on that. Um, but I was very dismayed by DHI's attitude to the modeling, particularly as I had held them in, in very high regard. Um, uh, particularly in young Christian Rivskov's day. Um, so I was quite disappointed to, to see this work coming forward. Are there any other questions from anybody in the audience? I mean, feel free to um, 
to unmute yourself and ask questions if you would like to. <laughs> Reminds me of teaching this. <laughs> teaching, teaching online during the pandemic and a whole load of black boxes. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, you made an interesting point at the end, Howard, and I think that there's more and more of these water conflicts going to happen. Um, I mean, what do you think the role is of of academics, actually, as well as practitioners like um, like Duncan, um, in terms of actually providing the this expertise to these cases? Because I can I can imagine that if more and more of these cases happen, um, it's almost like we could be overwhelmed with the need to provide mm. expert information mm. to to different different things. Well, I think the first thing to say is that there's a great opportunity to do really good science here. Because when states bring cases to an international court, money is not an issue. They mm. want to win. Um, and so we, we, both sides spent a lot of money um, doing really good science. Um, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, we have a special issue uh, in, in process at the moment, which is um, um, uh, validation of that. So I think there's... Um, a, a real good scientific argument for academics to get involved because you can do some really interesting work on very challenging problems. Um, and I, I think um, for the courts, um, I think academics probably um, have uh, a slightly enhanced reputation as, as being independent. Um, it, ultimately, these decisions really depend on the credibility of the witnesses. Um, mm -hmm and um, how judges perceive that credibility. So I think academics are in a very strong position to contribute. So I think there's really good science reasons um, and good legal reasons to get involved. So um, I would you know, wholeheartedly recommend that people do get involved. I think some of these cases um, expose some real uh, interesting challenges. There's a question just come in on the chat from Liv Burns. So it says, from a professional point of view, what's, what is the support to the person providing the advice? Do you get legal advice, wider support on what to expect when giving evidence? Okay, so, um, well, in, in all the cases I've been involved in, there's been a, a legal team and a science team. And um, the science team has included um, a lot of scientists from the host country. So Hungary, Argentina and Chile. Um, so basically I've been managing or helping to manage quite large science teams, science teams, maybe 20 or 30 people and students and so on. Um, so there's a lot of scientific support. Um, and then there's really an intense dialogue with the legal team um, because they want to know um, what the strengths and weaknesses are of the opposition's case and they want to build strong arguments for their case. And so um, before going into court, when we had, I mean, the court um, sees me as an independent witness. So I have to, I have a duty to the court to see, to tell the truth as I see it. Um, but nevertheless, um, we will discuss um, with the lawyers what sort of questions are likely to come up. Um, but then I'm completely free to answer um, uh, as I see best. So I've never had any you know, any pressure to tow a particular line, but um, obviously um, one's trying to put, um, bring out points that are, are helpful to the client. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Howard. Um, I think we're going to have to leave it there and we've got a 10 minute break now before we start the AGM. I can't see any other questions. Um, no very, hands, nice to see you. very nice to see Duncan and I hope there's <laughs> more friends out there in the ether. Uh, really nice. So just for information, I, I spend my summers in the UK, my winters in Arizona. Ah, uh, and, okay. and Jeff, Jeff McDonald here is at the moment, so I'm just going to I'm just going to go and have a coffee with coffee with him in Suffolk before he he pushes off and leaves us. So. Anyway, nice to reconnect and nice to see you. Great. It'd be nice to have you at a, an in-person BHS meeting well, soon. Well, I was, I was really hoping for that for this, but I can understand, you know, the logistics and so on. But yes, yeah. indeed. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Yeah, so we'll take a 10 minute break now and we'll start the AGM at half past 11. Perfect. Oh, good, 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 good. Excellent. Right, I think we'll make a start then. Um, so thanks everybody who's who's joining for the for what is the 41st annual general meeting of the British Hydrological Society in our um, 40th year. Um, so yeah, I'm Hayley Fowler. I'm president at the moment for probably another hour before I hand over. Um, and um, I'm going to, this is the agenda that I've put together um, for today. So I'm going to go through um, to see if there's any objections to the, the minutes and the report of the, the last AGM last year to give you a report um, on um, basically some of the governance um, updates on um, things like social media, um, our uh, memberships of the main committee. Then I'm going to give you a report that's been prepared by um, Scott McGrain, the honorary treasurer. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Emily Fowler to talk a bit about um, EDI as well. She's got a few slides on that. Um, and then we'll return to to any questions at the end. Um, so the last the report, I'm, I'm assuming people don't have any objections to the minutes um, or the report of this, but, but please do do speak up if you do. Um, so the previous AGM was held last year um, around the same date at Lancaster University um, during the symposium. And um, there was a report in, I think, circulation 156, um, which you can see here, but I'm just going to forge ahead if there were no objections. Uh, I'm assuming not. Um, so in my report, I'd like really like to sort of say thank you to, to everybody and particularly the committee who supported me um, along the, well, the last year, but also the last two years of being BHS president. Um, I think it's it's only through the support of of people who step up to be part of the main committee, but also to the membership themselves that we have this vibrant um, society that we're all happy to be members of um, and and you know as members you basically look after um, the UK's water supply sewerage and hydrometric systems there's there's lots of work that goes on and I think it's growing work as well and if we look around around the world at all the flood events that have happened just in the last 11 days actually it's something hydrology is something that's really important and it's something that's that's here to stay really so um thank you all to the membership um so one of the things that i wanted to talk about today is these are slides that i showed at the um at the agm last year but chris skinner has has been leading a review of governance in the society over the last um, two years now or certainly 18 months and his review made some recommendations and the first recommendation was that we would actually change the charitable status of the society to a charitable incorporated organization um, and this is this is a better entity for us to be we think as as trustees of the society um, it reduces the personal financial risk to those people who volunteer to be trustees. So you're not then responsible for, for any debts that the society might get into, et cetera, et cetera. But it also allows um, the charity to be more flexible in its in its governance structures. Um, and the membership was recently asked to vote on the change in, in status. Um, and we, we got the results of the vote in, in yesterday. I think the deadline was about four o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. So basically we asked members to adopt um, the proposed statutes um, for the BHS um, and to change the charitable status to a CIO. And um, we had 62 votes cast, which isn't a huge number of votes from, from the members. Um, but of those, we only had one person who disagreed with the change. So that is therefore, um, you know, it's it's a majority decision and therefore at the next committee meeting we'll start to implement that change in terms of changing the society's charitable status to a charitable incorporated organization 
And that means, of course, that we can also start to, to do recommendation two, um, which was about restructuring the society committees to create a greater separation between the governance um, so the, the trustees and the management structure. Um, and I really do think um, this this has been the case that there is quite a burden on the members of the main committee and it, it will be really good to actually be able to include and provide opportunities for for BHS members and this might be in particular early career academics or early career researchers or practitioners to actually get involved and help us achieve more within the society and you can see here how the new governance structure is intended to work um, and and hopefully um, Duncan as the new president will be able to to start to implement this and I'm on the committee for another year as past president as well and I think it, it will be nice to get this this set up. So moving on, um, we've got plans for the BHS um, 40th anniversary, which is this November. Um, Duncan has been organising a meeting which will be held on the 6th of November um, called Hydrology Learning Between the Generations, 40 years of the BHS. And I do believe that the um, registration for that meeting will be coming out very soon. Um, and that's at the Institution of Civil Engineers in London, a day meeting. Um, and as you'll have seen on the mail base, um, I put a message out on the mail base. I, um, my proposal to the Royal Society for a Science Plus meeting was also accepted recently. And so there'll be a meeting on the 10th and 11th of June next year at the Royal Society in London on hydrology in the 21st century challenges in science to policy and practice. And that will be um, invited speakers um, from inter international you know international invited speakers as well as national um, but then a dedicated poster session uh, to allow the the community to actually present science at that meeting as well um so thanking um celia again um circulation is our obviously our our newsletter um, and thank you to everybody who's contributed to um, circulation and please do keep those articles coming. Um, and as you all know, last year at the AGM, um, our long-standing technical secretary and the editor of circulation, Celia Kirby, announced her intention to retire. And I'd really like to thank Celia again for all of her efforts in delivering circulation um, every three months. And she's been doing this for the last 40 years. So it really it is a monumental effort and we can we can never thank Celia enough for this. Um, but she, she is retiring and we have found um, a new circulation editor um, who will be using a new email as well that you can see at the top there, which we'll also put on the website. Um, so Vicky Shackle has agreed to, um, to become our circulation editor. Um, she's worked, she works at the moment for um, JBA, um, but she has worked for various other water related organisations. Um, she's a hydrologist, a flood warning specialist and a project manager. Um, and she's working with the Environment Agency on their flood hydrology improvements programme. Um, and and she's usually found in the garden with her Labrador or swimming in a local river, which is which is nice. Open water swimming is uh, one of the things I like to do as well. Um, so thank you, Vicky. Um, and we look forward to um, to the next edition of Circulation. Um, we're also at the moment, as you'll have seen, advertising for a new um, web editor as well and we've decided to to split those roles Celia previously did both of those roles but they are really quite big roles and we've decided to split those roles um, and we're advertising for a for a web person so if you're interested please do apply for that position um, social media goes from strength to strength um, we've still got well, it's not called Twitter anymore X we've still got an X account um, so please do join up um, and follow the British Hydrological Society Twitter or X account if you're interested. Um, and thanks to Will Rust and Chris Skinner for looking after all of the social media that we have um, in the society. We've also got a YouTube account. Um, please go and have a look at the YouTube channel. I'm sure that I'm, I'm preaching to the converted anyway, but all of our webinars, a lot of our um, meetings are recorded. Um, and they're 
put onto the YouTube channel so you can go and watch them again if you would like to. Um, and finally, we've got a LinkedIn page as well if you would like to join that. And we've got lots of members. Um, but yes, again, if you were interested, um, please do join these social media um, groups. We've also got other um, formal partners. Um, so I'd like to thank them at this stage as well. So the ICE, um, we who provide support with our financial and membership management committee support and meeting support. support. So thanks in particular to, to Moira, who supports our meetings and um, does all the back of the scenes administration and organisation. Um, and to UK CEH as well. Um, their representation on the BHS main committee is through Lucy Barker. Um, and they also represent us on the UK Committee for International Hydrology um, and really do provide a lot of support to the BHS. So thank you for, for those. Um, we also were partnered with Hydrology Research. Um, we've recently decided as the trustees on the on the committee to discontinue our relationship with Hydrology Research. We had quite a lot of discussion about this. Um, and the consensus was that the partnership is of no real benefit to the society. Um, it's a small journal, it's accessible online, and most UK universities at least have signed up to the publishing fee waiver agreement. Um, so there's not that much um, benefit to actually having fee waivers for, for publications. And also we, we considered that a lot of BHS members were unable to publish their work in the special issue following the symposium in 2022. Um, that work in particular was from practitioners and it was considered to applied for the journal. So we'd like to find somewhere else to, to publish um, a special issue following the next symposium. And we have discontinued that relationship. Um, there's also just to just to, to say in this, there's some um, words on this in the honorary treasurer's report as well. Um, but please do um, think about the funds that we have in the BHS to attend um, conferences. Um, so we've got the Exeter Fund grant for IASH activities um, and other BHS conference grants as well. Um, and of course, these haven't really been utilised that much in the last few years because of the pandemic. But um, we are starting to see people use these um, these grants. But, you know, we've got quite a lot of funds, so please do apply for, for the money. So I wanted to move on to um, to talk about awards. Um, so there have been eight awards of master's studentships this year. We increased the amount of each studentship. Last year it was only £1,500 per student. This year it's gone up to £2,500, and that's to reflect the increased costs of living. Um, and thanks to the BHS membership, the JBA Trust and the Environment Agency for helping support these awards. Um, we've also had um, five submissions of undergraduate dissertations for the BHS Undergraduate Dissertation Prize. Um, and the prize winners are to be announced at the 40th anniversary meeting. Um, and we, we, yeah, so, so, so they are being evaluated at the moment. There's also, also the Peter Wolfe Symposium was recently held at uh, Newcastle University in uh, the end of June this year. Um, so I wanted to announce the awards from that as well. Um, and all of the, the award winners have been invited along to the 40th anniversary event in November as well. Um, so um, the, the voting actually, just to say, um, the voting was, I think for the first time, completely um, fair because everybody who was who was there got one vote each. So all of the early career researchers and practitioners um, voted. Um, rather than ju just judges voting on these um, these talks and posters. Um, so the best 15 minute talk prize winner was Acid uh, Raymond, who's doing a PhD uh, in the water group actually at Newcastle University um, on optimizing flood risk management interventions in cities and catchments in cities. Uh, the best five minute talk prize winner was by Ruth Dunn, who was who has just completed a master's at Newcastle University and is actually about to start a PhD at Newcastle University um, on the relationship between weather morphology and rainfall physicality. 
um, and you can see the organising committee in that bottom picture there as well. Um, and there were three joint poster prize winners. We had um, about just under 50 people at the symposium. We somehow managed to have equal votes across three people for the poster prizes. Um, so we had Anthony Jones from uh, Durham University, is the whole greater than the sum of its parts, assessing the combined effect of multiple natural flood management features on downstream flooding. Irina Rohrmuller, who's doing a PhD at Newcastle University, Next Generation of Global Hydrological Modelling, a physically based system for hydrological forecasting, and Eleanor Starkey, who's a research fellow at Northumbria University on SUDS, establishing a new vision for sustainable drainage and delivering sustainable and resilient urban communities. And you can see all the prize winners in that picture there. So moving on to changes to membership of the main committee. Um, there aren't too many people leaving this year, actually. I think we had quite a few people leave last year. But um, one person who is finishing their term of office on the main committee is Emily Fowler. And I'd really like to thank Emily. And she's going to speak in a minute, actually, on the, the EDI work that she leads um, for the BHS. And she's really had invaluable contributions in this space. And we're going to miss her. So thank you very much, Emily, for all of your contributions. Um, going on to um, new members, um, we had um, an election which also finished yesterday. And we um, had uh, two spaces available for new ordinary committee members um, and I'm happy to announce that um, that one of the the people nominated was Dr Chris White who's at Strathclyde University and leads the Engineering for Extremes research group and Chris is actually really keen to try and help connect hydrology with meteorological and climate communities to look at multi hazards um, and the improved access to postgraduate studies and early career opportunities as well. Um, and the other person who is elected, and I do apologise, Liv, because I couldn't find a picture, um, is Dr. Liv Burns. Um, Liv's at um, Jacobs. She's an active hydrologist with over 20 years industry experience in hydrology. Um, and keen to promote hydrology within the UK and can bring her perspective and enthusiasm to the committee. So focus on emerging technology, community engagement and encouraging more people to study and take up hydrology related careers. So really um, thanks to everybody who put themselves forward for the, um, the committee and um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Chris and Liv to, to the committee. Um, so, and thank you to everybody who has been, that's the wrong dates at the top there, sorry, should say 2022 to 23 uh, main committee. Thanks to everybody who's been on the BHS main committee this year. And that includes um, the BHS executive um, and the elected ordinary committee members and also co-opted members. Um, and I'm delighted to, to say as well, the honitor, Asadullah, um, who has been on maternity leave, will be returning to to join the BHS committee again um, from this meeting. And thanks not just to our com main committee members and trustees, but also to the representatives of the regional sections as well, um, and the representatives of UKCEH, the ICE, SIWEM and IASH, who also sit on the BHS committee for giving up your time. So I'll move on to um, the honorary treasurer's report, which has been put together um, by Scott McGrain, who can't make it today. Um, so yeah, he, he, he sort of summarised it as an annual budget that supported a lot of excellent activity. Um, so I can report that new members have slowed down this year, um, possibly because of the post-COVID cost of living crisis. Um, but we, our general accumulated fund um, is going up still um, to, to £91,000. Um, and income has significantly improved um, as normal business gets underway again. So national meetings have made around £3,000 and the symposium last year in Lancaster made 
um, over £18,000, which is it's fantastic. We also received a very generous uh, bequeath from the estate of Janet Wolfe, um, Peter Wolfe's wife, and um, that's con contributed to a very healthy financial position, which has allowed us to invest in, in people and activities. Um, our outgoings have increased um, because we've had national and international events commence and people have applied for um, travel grants to support their activities and attendance at those events. Um, and so that's been supported via both travel grants and the Exeter Fund grant as well. Um, and there's been continued success with website advertising and job advert revenue as well. Um, but and I agree with Scott here as well that, that we're in a great position to support activities. So, so please do do apply for travel grants. Um, and we encourage you to to continue submitting grant applications. Um, you know, to attend conferences, relevant workshops, or training. And we are going to review the amounts we can offer. Um, they haven't been changed for quite a long time, and I think we need to really change the the amounts we can offer to reflect the changing prices and the the massive increase in, in costs actually um, from the general cost of living um, increases. Um, we recently took the decision as a committee to support some events in the UK in exceptional circumstances, so um, to support travel to some events. Um, you know, we, we ask for, for details of, of why this is needed. Historically, we've only provided travel grants um, for overseas conferences, but I think we're collectively seeking to reduce carbon footprints um, and to attend more local events. Um, so the exception remains BHS events, as we, we actually provide um, most of these as a Zoom license and, and hybrid events. We've also, as I said, already increased the amount of MSc studentships to £2,500 uh, £2, per recipient um, this year. Um, there's a few, I think we had 10 awards last year, or maybe 12 awards, and we've only had eight this year. Um, so slightly lower number of applications. Um, we're not quite sure why this was, and we're going to have a look at this. Um, and we did discuss at the last committee a, a possible extension to this scheme as well. Um, so there's lots of upcoming future events that we're supporting, including the BHS's 40th anniversary event, and in particular we're supporting all of the um, prize winners from the Peter Wolf to attend that event as well um, through BHS funds. Um, and yeah, celebrating hydrology and the continued growth of the society. Um, <laughs> Although we've had massive problems with Zoom in the last two meetings we've had, including today, um, I do I do think it is a critical piece of infrastructure um, for both hosting regional meetings, um, opening them up to wider participation and um, to a national audience, um, and but also to, to to having meetings like this one. And there is um, a licensing fee now, so um, we will be, you know continuing to use Zoom as the society and we hope we can actually get this right um, in ongoing meetings. Um, and we've also got details here of the eight studentships that were the awards that were made this year as well um, at the bottom there. And you can see that's across a few different universities. Um, but yeah, we wish them well in their studies this year. So I'm going to hand over at this point to um, Emily, who's going to talk about equality, di diversity and inclusion. Thanks, Hayley. Um, hi, everyone. As Hayley said, I'm um, the subcommittee lead for EDI on the main committee. So I've been on the main committee for the last three years and leading the EDI subcommittee, I think, for the last year, maybe a bit longer. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of slides about uh, where we're at and some of the changes we've put into place uh, when it comes to EDI. So first of all, I just wanted to kind of uh, re-emphasise the importance of EDI and, and why it's important for the BHS. Um, and 
creating an environment and a culture where everyone feels empowered to contribute will benefit the whole of the hydrological community. Um, having that inclusive community will help facilitate learning and development and innovation and problem solving. And with the increasing challenges we're facing, this is just paramount, paramount and, and so important. And the BHS fully supports um, creating this EDI um, community. If you could skip forward a slide, please, Hayley. Um, so what have we been doing um, over this last year or two? We've developed um, and actioned the BHS EDI strategy. Um, part of that has been carrying out improved data collection. So we've updated the membership application form online to collect more data, um, collecting information on presenters at meetings and conferences, as well as at attendees, and also looking into um, the EDI of, of those who are winning uh, grants and being awarded um, scholarships, etc. Um, we've developed some useful guidance for meeting organisers um, and there's been some art articles in circulation that we've been um, pushing. Go forward one, Hayley. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, and moving forward, um, we want to continually action and review the BHS EDI strategy. So taking forward all that extra data that we're collecting and reviewing that um, to try and understand how we can improve our EDI. Um, we're going to have a report annually on EDI in circulation that kind of outlines uh, the, the makeup of the BHS. Um, continue to support circulation articles on EDI and, um, and the BHS supporting EDI events and schemes going forward. I think that's it really, just to give a brief update on, on EDI and, and show our, our support on that front. Thanks, Hayley. Great, thanks very much, Emily. Um, right, so, um, just to say, um, as I as I stand down at, as BHS um, president in this meeting, um, I've been really honoured to to serve the society, and um, I think it's a great it's a great society actually. Um, it's got a very big membership. I think it's very a very friendly place to be, um, and um, I wouldn't like to see it change too much. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been really delighted to 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 be at the helm of this of what I think is a great organization over the last two years um at the same time it's been hard work um and I'm I'm delighted to to, to hand it on um and I don't think it could be in um any better hands actually than um in our new BHS president um Duncan Faulkner who I'm sure everybody knows um, but um, but he is actually JBA Consulting, um, and I'm gonna gonna hand over to to Duncan now. Um, although I'll see if there's any questions first. But but yes, I'm delighted to hand over to to Duncan um, in his new role as BHS President for the next two years. So I'll see if I can stop sharing my screen. Um, if I can find the Teams call again. There it is. Stop sharing. Right. Here we go. I don't think there's any questions that are unanswered, Hayley. Um, there was one about online access to the 6th of November meeting, which I've answered that one in the chat. OK. And a any few people thanking you for the PhD awards as well, which you've, you've given us. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, OK, I have to sort that out. That was all from the website. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, right, OK, well, if there's no questions, I'll I'll hand over to to Duncan. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Hayley. Um, are we expecting something on FDRI? Did you mention as well? Yes. yes. I don't think he's here yet, though. Right, OK. No, Gareth had a meeting till 12, so um, All right. yeah, he I'll, said he'd get here as soon as possible as he could after that meeting. Well, I've only got about two minutes worth of stuff to say, so we'll see if he's here at 12. <laughs> <be> perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, first of all, apologies for any background noise. I, I tried to find a quiet corner of the office, but it looks like about 20 other people have done the same. Um, I 
mainly just wanted to say thank you to to Hayley for steering the BHS ship over the last couple of years. It's been quite turbulent waters at times as we've emerged from COVID. Um, but I think Hayley will be a very hard act to to follow. Um, and I'm excited really about this this new role. Um, and I thoroughly agree with your comment as well, Hayley, that um, I don't think I'd want much to change about BHS. It's a, it's a great organisation and a, a fantastic mixture of both, uh, you know, practitioners who work day to day on keeping things running hydrologically across the UK and also researchers and, you know, people in who sort of have a foot in both camps as well. Um, I also, I think Howard's not on the call anymore, but I just wanted to thank him for his talk. Um, it was 30 years ago this month that I arrived in London to start the master's course in hydrology at Imperial College run by Howard. So he's been really instrumental on my journey into hydrology. And it's been fantastic to see him again today after many years. Um, the 40th anniversary due on the 6th of November. We are hoping that tickets will be released for that any day now. It's it's in the hands of the ICE um, who are going to sell the tickets online via an, an, an event page. Um, do uh, book early because I fear this event's going to sell out, especially by the amount of interest we've had. And we will try and get online access arranged as well. Um, and in my email about it last month I did mention an opportunity to submit posters as well and that's still open so um, anybody interested in presenting a poster I think you've got until the end of this month end of September to submit ideas for posters to be presented on the 6th of November um, and then apart from that just a, a sort of plea for everyone to spread the word really about membership of BHS I think it's incredibly good value um, and really really keen to get as many people involved as possible from you know, there are many people I think we've we've seen that with a the, the survey of hydrologists which uh, the environment agency laid earlier this year there are many people involved in hydrology in the UK um, who aren't currently members of BHS but you know maybe they use hydrology maybe they have a lot of contact with people who do hydrology and so i think bhs is, is a very broad church and, and welcomes anyone who's interested really right that's all i had to say um is there any sign of gareth joining <laughs> oh yes there is yes, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, I think. Just joined. <laughs> Excellent. So welcome, Gareth. Um, we, we finished all the AGM business. Um, so over to you for um, a, a little word or two about FDRI, I think. Yeah, no, that's good. OK, if you bear with me a second. Um, OK, I was. Uh, <laughs> I'd expect I had a few minutes to just get my uh, screen in order if I just joined to listen to the last minutes, but there we are. I can be with you in a second. Take your time, Gareth, don't worry. That's all right. OK. How's that looking? Perfect. Shared screen, yeah? Yeah, looks great. Brilliant. OK, well. Firstly, then, thanks very much for the opportunity to um, give you a short update on the FDRI, the Flood and Drought Research Infrastructure Project um, that we've been working on. Um, I'll just give you a few words in by way of a reminder and then um, a very short update as to where we are now. So I'm um, I'm based at UKCEH. Um, I'm a, a, a principal hydrologist here, and I'm the science implementation lead um, for FDRI. So this uh, this is a, a huge opportunity for hydrological research. It's um, a unique investment in capital. So there's a, a, a large um, investment here. Um, that will really create a step change in um, the community's capacity um, to undertake hydro hydrological research. So it's very much um, been delivered um, here as an opportunity for all of us as community members um, to undertake hydrological research. 
So the, the overarching um, aim of FDRI is to provide observations of key components of the water cycle, um, along with a supporting digital infrastructure to enable um, scientific research throughout the community. So importantly, there would be um, research projects and programmes that would sit alongside FDRI to um, use this infrastructure um, for their scientific research. And in the planning, the design of FDRI, and we've undertaken a, a comprehensive um, consultation exercise and many specific requirements and questions um, for both observations and digital have fed into the planning um, of the, the infrastructure. So FDRI is, um, has been undertaken a scoping study um, a, and a planning phase, and then it will go on to um, deliver and implement and operate FDRI. And it is a, a partnership um, project, and it's been led by um, myself at UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, but we have partners at the British Geological Survey, Imperial College London, and the University of um, Bristol. And there's also an associated community advisory group. So as I said, th these are really key aspects of this because this is being delivered for all of us as a community. Um, and the diagram on the right here just um, gives us a, a, just a reminder here of the phases of FDRI. So we had a scoping phase which began in um, spring 2020 that um, concluded with an application for capital funding to UKRI and we secured the intention for funding at to, to the level of 38 million. Um, and then that enabled us to undertake a planning and design phase, which we're now in, um, which will um, submit a full business case or NERC will on, on behalf of this activity in October. And then that will um, secure the funding in the end of this year in December, which would allow implementation to start next spring um, for a period of three at uh, the minimum period of three years which would allow the operation of FDRI to begin in 2028 and UKCH will be responsible for the ongoing operation of FDRI um, and it is important to say there's no um, new monies here um, for UKCH um, so there are some important discussions and decisions there as to um, how funds are um, reallocated for that period. So that's an important part. Um, there is a, a report on the consultation that's on the FDRI pages on the UKCH website, so you can find more details there. Um, and I just want to point out there are some key elements to um, this flood and drought research infrastructure. Firstly, it's a platform, a, a UK wide platform, and that includes a number of key elements. So there are uh, proposed three instrumented catchments, which are shown on the left here, which is the Thames, Severn and Tweed. They are um, complemented by mobile instrumentation, um, some of which would be available for event response. Some may be deployed for longer periods of time. And that instrumentation, whether it be fixed or mobile, um, is targeted to all elements of the terrestrial water cycle, as shown by that infographic on the middle there. And this part of the work is being co-led by um, John Evans at UKCH and John Bloomfield of the British Geological Survey. But as well as this, there are some additional really important aspects of FDRI other than the observational capa um, capacity, and that is the support for innovation. So we really want to um, enable innovation throughout the hydrological community. And that's been led by um, Wouter Baitert from Imperial College. And key aspects of that work are firstly adopting innovative infrastructure in the capital investment. Secondly, in including field based test beds so um, community researchers can, can go and have access to sites with um, key facilities there to support their ongoing research, um, whether it be plug and play telemetry or power and access, those sorts of things. And finally, the part of that is really to um, foster a strong innovation community. The, the, the next part is the capacity building program um, that is being led by Gemma Coxon, um, who I know is on, on this call today. Um, 
and and this is a really and again another really important part of this because we recognize that um the success of something like fdri is certainly not about the instruments in the field but it's about the people that use them and the capacity and training that they have so gem is really lead in this area and it's is very much very busy now on designing um, the skills training that's required, the community engagement activities that we need to have in place and associated with that, that's the meetings and conferences and events that need to be put in place to actually bring those communities together and to um, really create new ways of working um, across the community using this platform. And then last but not least is the digital infrastructure and I I'd really like to emphasize this. This is a major part of the investment and some key aspects of it are enable and then um, more um, comprehensive discovery, access and integration of data. So the FDRI data, whether it be new data or third party existing data, there'd be um, effort put in here to making it accessible near real time um, so that researchers can have easy access and integration and also we'll be supporting um, researchers where they come and collect data and they can plug into our telemetry systems and help with the archiving and processing and quality control of data so there are many aspects of that that is a big part of the project a slide just to give you a um uh, just a very quick feel for where we are now so as i mentioned the business full business case will be going in by, by NERC in early october to get to that point there has been a huge effort on the costing. So we have to demonstrate the affordability of FDRI. So over the summer period in particular, there's been a lot of work focused on costing the infrastructure. Um, and as part of that, we've shared a measurement strategy with our community advisory group. And that happened in July. And the key aspect of that to show was to show the, um, the give an indication of the number of different types of measurements um, we were able to support with this funding in the three catchments. So in a generic way, there were um, infrastructure um, designs shared um, with the group for, for the three catchments. So as I say, in a generic way, we had one set that was applicable to all three. But a really important step taking that forward now is that was really undertaken to give the assurance of the costing. What ha will happen next now is that we will develop perceptual models for each of the catchments. So that's not a numerical modeling of the catchments, but it's understanding what are the key challenges and processes within these specific catchments. And that will um, be, be undertaken to not only identify the scientific challenges, but also the opportunities in those places. Um, and that will um, also go hand in hand with identifying the most appropriate measurement technologies. So in our measurement strategy, we've mentioned that we need measurements of rainfall, for instance. This takes it a step further in looking at what technologies and what are the specifications um, of those pieces of equipment. And that will enable a much more detailed catchment specific design for each of these places um, where we expect to have a lot more targeted engagement um, with members of the community. Um, within these catchments and in the broader hydrological community. And that really is particularly important in many of these aspects in understanding perceptual models, the opportunities to build on existing projects, existing infrastructure, identifying the science challenges, all these things will be grounded in many of those discussions. And then we'll have this much more specific infrastructure design where we'll then tension those um, generic plans for those three catchments that I mentioned with the available budget to optimise what is put in place in each of those. Um, and then the, we're expecting the confirmation of the funding in December of this year to enable the implementation of FDRI to begin the spring of next year. And even throughout implementation, it's really important that there's ongoing engagement in these places and with community to optimise the rollout of this as priorities will in, undoubtedly change over the three year implementation periods. So it's really important that we build in the maximum flexibility that we can. Um, and that's all I'd like to say at this point by way of update. So I, I hope that was useful in just giving you a reminder as to what this is about, a feel for where we are now and an indication as to where we're going. And I really look forward to um, future interactions with many of you on this. Um, in the planning and design and ultimately in the usage through the research projects and programs that this will enable. 
So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing there. Thanks very much, Gareth. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions for Gareth or for anybody. No, I can't see anything in the chat, Gareth. So okay, thanks. Thanks very much for the update. That was um, excellent. Um, unless anybody's got any other business that they would like to um, to to raise now, um, I think that that concludes the the annual general meeting for this year. Um, so please do raise your hand if you want to say anything, um, and otherwise. I think we'll we'll finish here.